For reasons I don't really get myself, I got really, really excited last year when it was announced that Ash Ketchum was retiring from the Pokemon anime. In fact, I got so excited that I decided to watch every episode of the anime, especially all the ones that I hadn't seen, since I stopped watching sometime during the Johto seasons over 20 years ago. When I began to re-enter the fandom, I realized that there was a lot that I didn't know, and that by talking to people, I could learn a lot of interesting new stuff about the anime that I hadn't as a kid. I learned a lot by reading the blogs of people like Degas of Degas's Backpack and Dr. Lava of Dr. Lava's Cut Content and Did You Know Gaming, both of whom had been part of the fandom for decades and had access to primary sources. Learning these things was easy and fun. What was much more difficult was unlearning all the bullshit that people told me that turned out to be wildly wrong. Fake leaks, uninformed opinions, or speculation passed off as fact are this franchise's bread and butter. The anime side of the fandom isn't immune to this at all, and in the grand scheme of things, it probably doesn't matter as much because fewer people talk about the anime than the games. But the anime has had over 26 years for countless layers of entrenched bullshit to be considered as fact, making it frustrating to even try to talk about the anime with people. For example, did you know that Pokemon was originally going to end with a Pokemon Slave Revolt until a giant T-Rex would be revived and kill everyone? Well, if you did, you actually don't know shit. Now, I'm not going to tell you the real story because you should read Dr. Lava's blog where he goes into great detail about how the Pokemon anime was supposed to end. Dr. Lava did his research. You should give him your attention and your clicks rather than whatever YouTuber sold you that bullshit. Now, I'm not going to talk about the pieces that Degas or Dr. Lava have provided the community. Instead, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite pieces of misinformation. It goes something like this. When Pokemon Johto began wrapping up, the writing team wanted to make a change to the cast. They had two options put on the chopping block. Misty, the main heroine up to that point, or Team Rocket, the show's trio of recurring gag villains. Then the anime's head writer, Takeshi Shudo, stepped in and decided to axe Misty. He felt that Misty was boring and wasn't charming enough as a girl, plus he really, really loved Team Rocket. As a result, when Pokemon Advance aired, Misty was replaced by Mei, a player character from the Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire games. From that point on, every new generation of the Pokemon anime replaced the heroine until Ash Ketchum's retirement last year. If you've been around Pokemon anime discourse for any amount of time, you may have heard some version of the story. It's been repeated over and over again in tons of internet arguments over Pokemon's corporatization, a perceived decline in quality of the anime over the years, and fandom wars between fans of Misty and her detractors. As good of a story as it is, however, it's pretty much bullshit. Like the T-Rex story, enough parts of it are true enough that if you give it a quick smell test, it seems to be okay. But after being filtered through layers of misunderstanding and pointless bickering between different parts of the fandom, what we're left with is bullshit. Unfortunately, the bullshit is a thing that gets repeated and entrenched in people's minds. To get to the bottom of this myth about how Misty was killed off, I had to retrace large portions of the Pokemon fandom's history. This included hiring a translator, and diving deep into the dark abyss of decades-old forum posts about shipping in Pokemon. <coughs> oh, it was fun. It was so much fun. I hate Pokemon fans now. With all that said, let's mosey. To find out where the myth came from, we should start by figuring out who the supposed head writer who killed Misty actually is. That part everyone actually knows. His name is Takeshi Shudo. Takeshi Shudo was an acclaimed screenwriter and novelist. He began working in manga and anime in the 1970s, and by the early 1980s, he had a steady stream of work as a freelance scriptwriter for companies like Tatsunoko Pro and Ashi Productions. Prior to working on Pokemon, Shudo's most famous anime was Magical Princess Minky Momo, which he not only wrote scripts for, but also served as a series composer. Basically, the anime equivalent of a showrunner. Shudo led the writing team and made decisions about world building and other high-level concepts in the creative side of the show. According to Kunahiko Yuyama, the director for Miki Momo and later the executive director for the Pokemon anime, Shudo possessed a unique tempo that no other screenwriter had. By 1996, Yuyama handpicked Shudo to showrun Pokemon because Pokemon was something with cute pictures and a journey that's not serious. However, there were moments with deep underlying themes. This was something that Shudo's previous work on Minky Momo and the episodic musical anime Idol Angel Yoko So Yoko made him especially adept at writing. Shudo was the head writer who came up with the T-Rex fossil idea. He's a very, very interesting man, but his greatest gift to mankind was that he left behind so much detail about his time as a writer. In 2006, he was offered a weekly column about screenwriting for the industry website Anime Style. In these columns, Shudo detailed his writing philosophy, going into depth about his work on all the different shows he wrote for, including Pokemon. Meanwhile, Pokemon fans, especially English-speaking ones, had been dying for some look behind the curtain for years, with the only real inside baseball coming from rumors, dubious leaks, and My cousin works at Nintendo. A couple of Shudo's blogs have been translated over the years by fans, though there is still a ton to go through. Shudo's blogs contain a goldmine of insight into early Pokemon, including the Pokemon Lugia's creation, and how the production team responded to the infamous Porygon seizure episode. 
It is in Shuno's anime-style blog that he provided the foundation for the idea that he murdered Misty in cold blood. In particular, Entry 201, Sorry I Forgot About Kasumi, posted on November 11th, 2009. Entry 201 takes place in the middle of a series of columns where Shudo talks about the second Pokemon movie, Revelation Lugia in Japan, or The Power of One in English. Shudo dives into Misty's character. In particular, he voices his frustration with Misty. In the second Pokemon movie, Ash, Misty, and their non-Union Brock equivalent, Tracy, are traveling in the Orange Islands. During a storm, they're driven to an island that is celebrating an annual festival and meet a girl named Melody. Melody flusters Misty by kissing Ash in front of her. Melody's kiss makes Misty jealous and sparks an argument by implying that Ash was Misty's boyfriend. In both Japan and abroad, these scenes had been, understandably, interpreted by fans as teasing Misty having a crush on Ash. These scenes have been used as shipping fodder for a number of years because children's cartoons in the 1990s taught us all to interpret any mention of a relationship as concrete proof of it existing. In Entry 201, Shudo regrets that he wrote the movie in this way. He felt like he wrote it in such a way that the fans didn't understand what he wanted to communicate through these interactions. Actions. Some people feel that behind the line, Satoshi just happens to be where I want to go. There is a hidden romantic interest in Satoshi that Kasumi herself is unaware of, but this is a fake scene that I prepared to make Kasumi's presence stand out. Kasumi has no romantic feelings for Satoshi. If Kasumi's romantic feelings for Satoshi were to become one of the themes of Pokemon, the entire structure of the Pokemon series would be destroyed. The rest of Entry 201 goes into more detail about Shudo's conflict with writing Misty especially the high expectations put on him for how well he wrote women characters, his irritation with how men are incapable of seducing women, and several digressions about how cool Team Rocket is. Now I want to break here and emphasize that while some of that sounds very strange, none of it is at all surprising for reading Shudo's blogs. He did come up with the idea of resurrecting a T-Rex fossil and had to be told no, after all. I'll come back to what Entry 201 actually says later. As you can imagine, though, the blog sparked interest in the Pokemon fandom because it broaches the topic of potential relationships, something that the Pokemon anime had actively tried to avoid in any substantial way up to that point. A lot of hay was made out of the blog, both by Ash and Misty shippers who were furious that Shudo denied any romantic implications between their two faves. But wow, Misty's getting some tough love from Shudo, and it makes me glad he was no longer a writer. Honestly, a lot of what Shudo says doesn't add up, and I'm starting to notice this trend between him and Hidaka about Misty not being girly enough. It's disgusting how sexist Shudo is towards Misty as a character. Again, take his words with a grain of salt. Well, honestly, I'm almost convinced that it's a fake after translating this part. Too many inconsistencies, too many things left in the air. Shudo really must have been outside like a balcony to write this stuff. It seems more like stuff written by Pika shippers, pearl shippers, and fan shippers to me. What the fuck is this even about? Honestly, I don't give a damn. Shudo, think what you want. Misty is the best character in any series you've ever created, and I'm not the only one who thinks so. And if you hate it, well, never mind, because I love this character. I love her from when I was little, and I will love her forever because she is part of me, and she is part of all of us, and we hope that this long, long Pokemon journey ends as it begins. None of your other sweetest, most trained female characters could do it, because even though it was only an anime, the feeling between those two was able to pierce the screen and make us love this series to the point of following it, even now that it has lost all of the magic it had when the legendary initial group existed. And anti-shippers, who, quite frankly, are the only people who need to touch grass more than regular shippers. You fell for four kids' lies and manipulations. She wasn't even a romantic interest. According to the late Takeshi Shudo, <coughs> the anime's main screenwriter, in a blog he maintained when he was live, the anime's goal was always to be about Ash's bond with Pikachu. A romance would only get in the way. He goes so far as to say that a certain scene he had in the second film was a fake scene just to make the character's reason for existing stand out. All of the supposed signs and little songs are all the invention of four kids who think that anime is an American cartoon and just because it has a protagonist and a girl of the same age in the cast, they have to be a couple. I only find it interesting that Takeshi was never up for discussion, but organizing a replacement for him would have been stupid, because with another gym leader you would have thought, how boring. With another trainer, the focus would have moved too far away from Satoshi, and a male coordinator would have been too far removed from the purpose of competitions, namely to create something that is also appealing to girls, and two girls in a shonen series would have been too much. I have read a lot of these. They are often really, really sad while also being really, really funny, but 
in the end, it distracts from what I find much more interesting, so I'm going to go back to that now. The closest source I could find to the original English excerpt of Entry 201 is a post on the free webs page run by two members of the Bulba Garden forums. The site owners, Musashi and Jesse Rocket KA, quoted a post from Bulba Garden's Poké shipping thread that I've not been able to retrieve that says the following. I've just learned that Team Rocket's existence in the show was endangered before Pokémon AG. They had a choice, whether to substitute her or Team Rocket, but he didn't permit to substitute Team Rocket since they had a sense of existence. He felt sorry for Kasumi, but for him it was Team Rocket trio he regarded highly the most. They also included another thread quote which interpreted some of the rest of Entry 201. He also said out of all the characters in the show, Kasumi's existence was the least justified. She was there to draw attention of girls, because anime with boys would only be tasteless for them. And why she left the show. After the show got longer, there was a decline in ratings, so they thought of changing something about the main characters and the villains. Because justification of Kasumi's existence was the weakest, she was the most in danger to leave. He says that it wasn't like he wanted to substitute her, but they needed someone with fascinating personality, whose existence was necessary. Musashi posted these excerpts from their website to Bulba Garden for discussion, and the reactions were interesting, but honestly, fairly subdued. Wow, Misty fans might want to stay away from entry number two there. Youch! What to say, then I'm very disappointed with motives and actions behind writers, especially when it comes to Misty. First, that he introduce her in show, give her plots, start to develop her just to slowly stop with time ditching her in end with her halfway developed story never getting ending nor progress? They did big mistake with this. It's really interesting to see a former writer bash Kasumi and Poke shipping so much. Poke shipping getting trolled lol. It's not entirely clear where the news spread from here, but if you search for key phrases from any of the quotations in the post, you'll find the myth repeated on various forum threads, not only in English, but also in Portuguese, Italian, and German, as well as on sites like Tumblr, Reddit, 4chan, and at least one YouTube video that no longer exists, but I've been able to find some references to in various forums. The myth may have entered into a wider consciousness through a video by the cartoon gamer about Takeshi Shudo's influence on early Pokemon. And it ultimately came down to either removing them or Misty. Misty ended up getting Getting the boot in the end, as we all know, but Shudo explained that without Team Rocket, Pokemon just wouldn't be Pokemon. The myth of Shudo killing off Misty spread because it is an attractive story. For one thing, it applies a few things fans already wanted to believe about the Pokemon anime. The idea that Shudo was forced to choose between Misty and Team Rocket suggests that at some point, corporate bigwigs got involved in the creative and ruined the show. Coincidentally, this happened right around the time when the first generation of Pokemon fans, such as myself, were growing out of the anime, and began to see everything that came after that point as worse than what they had grown up with. Moreover, I think people like this myth because it gives fans of particular characters something to latch onto. Fans of Team Rocket are delighted that they got the thumbs up from the head writer. Fans of the women leads that came after Misty are happy that Shudo's decision allowed their favorite girl to be part of the show. Fans of Misty... They aren't happy, but then again, they never are but they do get a name to point to whenever they feel especially victimized. And that's worth something, I guess. As I mentioned earlier, parts of the myth are true. Shudo did say that Misty lacked charm. Shudo also did say that her existence was the least justified. Moreover, Misty did leave the show and Team Rocket did stay. But as compelling a narrative as it is, the myth as a whole isn't true. And not only is it not true, it doesn't actually stand up to any scrutiny by anyone who knows anything. For one thing, Takeshi Shudo was only in charge of series composition until the end of the first Johto season, over two years before Misty was hit by a bus. Shudo had a notoriously bad spell of health during the Lugia movie. He had fallen into such a depression over creative differences that he drank incessantly and abused prescription pain medication, often at the same time. By the end of the first year of Johto, Shudo's health had deteriorated to such a degree that he couldn't handle being in a decision-making position, so he stepped down. He continued to write scripts for individual episodes, but when tasked with writing the fourth movie, he had to pass due to his physical and mental health. Shudo was nowhere near the production meeting where the decision was made to reshuffle the cast for Pokemon Advanced. He was probably in a methadone clinic, trying to figure out how to make an episode about Furret interesting. Quick sidebar, I did learn something interesting as I was recording this video. Apparently concept art for Pokemon Advanced showing Mei and Ash's final designs was being circulated in July 2001. This would have been near the end of Johto League Champions, or roughly the second year of the Johto series. This does show that by that point, the production team was preparing a new female lead for Advance. There's no concept art for Brock or Max though, so whether Misty was going to stay or not is unknown. Let's say that she wasn't. Takeshi Shudo's last episode of Series Composer debuted on August 3rd, 2000, almost a year before. Given a six month lead time, this episode was being devised probably in January or February 2000. Now granted, this is also the last episode that he was credited with, 
He may have not been giving any input for many months before they finally reduced his role. All this is to say that Judah was out of a position of responsibility almost a year and a half before May was conceived. That is less than two years, but still long enough that no, he was not involved in killing Misty. On Gesidebar. Secondly, the decision to decapitate Misty and put her head on a pike would not have been Shudo's decision to make even if he were a series composer. This is one of the subtleties that gets lost in translation when referring to Shudo as Pokemon's head writer. It's not incorrect, but people tend to misunderstand what his role actually was. When serving as series composer for an original series like Minky Momo, yes, Shudo would have had the say in decisions as big as changing characters. But Pokemon was different. It was a game adaptation that was quickly morphing into a global multimedia enterprise. There were too many stakeholders who had more deciding power than him, and not just the animation directors and producers. When Shudo wrote about the early days of Pokemon, he noted that he arrived in the writing room long after major decisions had already been made. In particular, he notes two corporate figures who were involved in the planning process for the anime, Masakazo Kubo of Shogakukan and an unnamed liaison between the production staff and merchandising companies. Shudo often referred to Kubo as Gozen-sama, because Kubo notably complained in a shrill voice about ideas he didn't like during production meetings. He's the one that told Shudo, no you can't have the fucking T-Rex fossil, which led to Shudo coping by doing his favorite thing, drugs! The unnamed liaison, on the other hand, seemed much more helpful to Shudo. He listed the completed scripts and sorted out the Pokémon that appeared in each episode. He made a table and brought it to every script meeting. Plus, he really likes Pokémon. He also gives us different ideas for each story. He did most of what the series' composition does, and I was grateful for what this producer did for me. As an aside, this person still sends me a cardboard box full of Pokémon goods every year instead of a midsummer gift. Now helpful as he was, this reveals something kind of important. Pokemon was always filled with corporate interference. Yes, even during the episodes that you grew up with and have fond memories of. Despite being the head writer, Shido himself was actually fairly hands-off. He let the professional scriptwriters write their episodes and try not to interfere unless it went against the theme or the setting he was trying to convey. An example he gives is the series comp memo he wrote for episode 5, where Ash meets Brock. He says that the notes he provided were as simple as... Satoshi goes to the Pokemon Gym in Nibi City and meets Takeshi and Takeshi ends up traveling with Satoshi. The Pokemon he meets is Ewark. Brock's entire backstory then was completely in the hands of Junkie Takigami, the writer for that episode and a longtime colleague of Shudo's going back to his work for Studio Ashi. So to recap, by 2001, Shudo wasn't in a position to kill Misty. Even if he had been, it wouldn't have been his decision to make. And even if he did have that permission, he likely would have left well enough alone because Misty's presence didn't encroach on any of his ideas. So if Shudo didn't kill Misty, then why does he say that he did in Entry 201? Well, to figure that out, you have to go back to the source, which is what I did. Let's return to Entry 201. I hired Wendy Gitlord, a translator and fan archivist who isn't so entrenched in the Pokemon fandom so as to be a poo brain, to translate Entry 201 into English. You can read the entire thing on this website I made specifically to give this thing a place to live. With the full context of the blog post, it becomes clear where the original translators mixed up Shudo's point. Here are Shudo's exact words about Misty being replaced. Pokemon was an anime in which Takeshi was replaced as the main character because foreign countries would not accept the narrow eyes of an oriental face. In the end, Takeshi was found to be well-received in foreign countries, and as you know, he returned to the anime. When a show runs for a long time and the ratings begin to decline, the lead and antagonist roles are replaced in the name of strengthening the show. When it came to replacing the main characters, the most at risk was Kasumi, who had little presence. I did not want to replace Kasumi. To that end, she had to have an appealing personality and presence. I tried my best, but for me, the presence of the Team Rocket trio was more important. Shudo here is not saying that there was a meeting he attended where Misty and Team Rocket were put on the chopping block and he chose Team Rocket because he loves them so much. He is saying that, given that the decision makers had replaced Brock for Tracy in the Orange Islands, he feared that Misty would be next. In trying to get ahead of any talks of replacing Misty, Shudo needed to polish her character. Still, Shudo acknowledged that Misty was the least needed protagonist. While her inclusion was not a corporate mandate, as I have seen bandied about online, the people who made decisions felt that Pokemon needed a female lead for girls to relate to. Shudo's task for the series was to integrate Misty in an interesting way, and up to the Lugia movie, Shudo felt that neither he nor his all-male writing staff had done so. In particular, because they were all men, and men are not capable of writing interesting women characters, none of them had written Misty in such a way as to bring out her charm as a woman character. If Misty did not have something to make her unique, compelling and justified in being in the anime after a few years, she, like Brock, would be replaced. 
To prevent that, Shudo wanted Misty to have a strong role in the Lugia movie. So in the movie, he decided to include the scenes about Misty being jealous over Melody's kiss. For Shudo, however, Misty's rivalry with Melody was less about her romantic feelings for Ash and more about Misty's dependence on Ash for her existence. The thing I want you to remember about the word existence when Shudo uses it here is that he does not just mean Misty's presence in the anime. He also means existence from Misty's perspective as a person within the ontological constraints of the show that she occupied. In Revelation Lugia, I prepared a scene in which she rescues Satoshi from drowning in the sea. She revives Satoshi with artificial respiration, but in fact, in this scene, Kasumi in the script repeatedly punches Satoshi's chest, who is not breathing. If Satoshi dies here, what is my place in Pokémon? My intention was not to express her love for Satoshi to live, but her anger at the fact that her existence would become more diluted if Satoshi died. In other words, Shudo wanted Misty to angrily exert a conception of herself that was independent of Ash. In the actual movie, the one that we got, however, she would realize that she was in fact dependent on Ash to have any meaning. So instead of being angry, she acknowledges this as she goes to save him from drowning, referring to him as her burden in Japanese. Four Kids gave the line a bit more romantic je ne sais quoi in English, but Shudo didn't write that, so who the fuck cares? The change in tone from Shudo's original vision was, as you can probably guess, a corporate decision. The punching was removed because the upper management thought that this scene could be misinterpreted as a violent scene in other countries. That scene, in which Kasumi's anger is not visible, could have been seen as an expression of affection by Kasumi, who was desperate to save Satoshi's life. But then, she's just a very ordinary, stereotypical girl. In Revelation Lugia, which I tried to fill with unique characters, Kasumi became a very ordinary girl. Later, Pokemon entered a new series and Kasumi was replaced by another girl. If this all sounds weird and oddly philosophical for a kid's movie to you, then congratulations, let me introduce you to Takeshi Shudo. One of the main reasons why you liked Pokemon as a kid. One thing that the myth gets right is that Shudo loved Team Rocket. He had a long-standing friendship with Jesse's voice actor, Megumi Hayashibara, and he gave the trio's voice actors ample leadway to ad-lib whenever they recorded his scripts. Not only did Shudo write their motto and have them say it in every episode, but he also wrote their insert character song, Team Rocket Forever. He did not write every important Team Rocket episode, or even most of them, but his love for them is undeniable. If Shudo had had his way, when Pokemon Gold and Silver had released, he would have replaced the entire main cast to start a Pokemon 2 anime, with Team Rocket being the only returning characters. You cannot read Shudo's anime style column for very long without him reminding you of the fact that he saw Team Rocket as the true main characters of the Pokemon anime. All of this is to say that if Team Rocket's role in the anime was ever endangered, Takeshi Shudo would likely have chugged a bottle of opioids right in front of the production staff in protest. Shudo's ambitions for Team Rocket took center stage over Misty. As much as he wanted to save Misty, Team Rocket was there, and they had Blackjack and Hooker. So Misty ended up being an essential and was replaced by the end of Johto. That is Shudo's regret. He wanted both Team Rocket and Misty to continue on as long as Ash did, but he knew he had failed to write Misty in a compelling way to justify her existence. Misty, therefore, was boring and inconsequential. So it goes. But don't worry, fans of Misty. If it brings you any comfort, it's worth noting that Shudo did not hate Misty. Shudo hated himself. If Misty was a non-essential, typical, boring girl character, Shudo viewed that as his personal moral failing. If he had been a better writer, he thinks, or if he had lived up to the expectations people put upon him, the Misty of the Pokemon anime would have become a more interesting, unique version of herself, one that was absolutely irreplaceable. If you feel particularly victimized that she didn't get to do as much as the other women leads, then Shudo agrees with you, and he hates himself for it. One of the things I regret about the Pokemon series that I was involved in as series organizer was that I could not bring out the charm of Kasumi. I felt sorry for the voice actor, but Kasumi in Pokemon was quite a painful presence for me as well, as I had been told by others that Shudo, the screenwriter, is good at writing girls. It might also be of comfort to know that Shudo was agnostic about whether Misty's replacements were any more attractive than she was. Shudo had zero interest in any type of gin warring or waifu baiting. Shudo took the reference to Stand By Me in the original Pokemon games to heart and wanted the anime to be a story about growing up and how humans interacted with Pokemon. Even if human romance could be explored, if it took place between Misty and Ash, or Ash and anyone, then it would dilute the themes he wanted from the anime. In terms of relationship, only his friendship with Pikachu was essential, and much to the anime production staff's credit, they followed his wishes until the very end, because that's how the Pokemon anime ended. Ash and Pikachu going off on an adventure together, with Team Rocket lurking somewhere in the background. At the end of the day, whether it was Misty, Brock, or their successors, everyone is expendable in the end, except for Team Rocket.
At the beginning of this video, I showed off a headline, Pokemon confirms Ash will return, but not how fans want, by a contributor to Giant Freakin' Robot, a website of uncertain credibility. Now, they do have a credibility page that they're very proud of, which extols how good their original reporting is, so they seem to be on the level. But considering their mythology page lists them as one of the top 4,000 most visited websites in the world, while their top rank is actually 4,821, I get the impression that whenever they feel like it, some of their articles play it fast and loose with reality. So what's the actual story behind this headline? Well, it turns out that Kunihiko Yuyama, the executive director of Pokemon, made some comments in an Odo Media interview that amounted to, Ash is forever 10 years old, a statement that he'd made several times in the past, while also adding, I think we'll see Ash sometime in the future. This interview was summarized and translated by Degas of Degas's backpack in February 2023, shortly before Ash was retired officially. Ultimately, the interview is kind of a non-story. Yama didn't confirm anything, but he isn't throwing out the possibility of an Ash return either. But that's not an interesting story, is it? Giant Freakin' Robot reported in November 2023 that Yuyama, in a new interview, said that Ash was definitely coming back, but only as a 10-year-old. Their source for this rumor was comicbooks.com. Degas is never mentioned in the article, which is already a bad sign, and to make matters worse, the misrepresentation is the only actual news in this article. The rest of it is base-level filler that ends on the easiest fucking joke to make about Pokémon. The comicbook.com article that GFR references, Pokémon fans will see Ash again, anime exec confirms, also came out in February 2023, around the same time as the Degas translation. Surprisingly, this article is slightly better. The author gives context to who Kunihiko Yuyama is, and they report a much more mild statement that Yuyama thinks we'll eventually see Ash return, which is more accurate to what Degas originally published, though the word eventually in that quote is doing a lot of heavy lifting. Now, of course, I say all this, but the very next paragraph begins with a weasel-worded attempt to push the headline again. Yuyama apparently introduced the possibility that it was only a matter of time before Ash returns. The suggestive phrase, a matter of time, appears in other articles that crib from comicbooks.com, including Screen Rant and Softonic. Solid original reporting, isn't it? The story is frustrating for a couple of reasons. The first is that Degas's actual original reporting, using his skill for translation and his access to the primary source, is not only distorted, but hidden. Unfortunately, because his platform is so small and his subject is so niche, it does not matter that he does actual original reporting, because the people who churn articles for bigger sites will always have their voices carried further than his. Maybe that doesn't bother him, but it does bother me. I think people who do the work should get the credit, and the people who use that work should give credit, or at the very least, respect the intentions of the author enough to honestly report from their findings. It's also frustrating because... I don't know, it's bad to make up bullshit for clicks. Think about it like this. The Giant Freaking Robot article came out over eight months after Degas translated the interview and comicbooks.com reported on it. If you're so inclined, you can generously excuse people who have to rush to report a breaking news story for getting minor details wrong. But eight months? The story hadn't developed since February. There was literally no news to report. Is Ash coming back? Who the fuck knows? I'm recording this in February 2024. With the gift of hindsight, I still don't know. No one does. Not even Kunihiko Yuyama, who is in a position to know, seemed to know at the time when there was news. Giant Freaking Robot chose to publish a story that was not only a complete misrepresentation of the facts, but eight months out of date. That's not original reporting. That's lying. Lying is bad. And it's especially shameful for one of the top 5,000 websites in the world to platform outright misinformation. The reason I'm picking on this particular topic is because I have seen this article or its equivalent being passed around for over a year now, getting people's hopes up for something that may not come true. And a part of me would like to just blame people for not reading, but they also shouldn't be lied to by people who make money to report on stories of interest, especially when the actual source of information is so readily available that everyone plagiarizes from it. Alright, the long sanctimonious rant about clickbait is over. Now you may be asking what any of that has to do with the Kill Misty myth. Surely there's no equivalence between someone misrepresenting someone else's words and what happened when the Entry 201 translation hit Bulbapedia, right? Okay, okay, so intentions do matter. I believe that Musashi and Jesse Rocketka were acting in good faith and wanted to share something they were genuinely excited about finding. And I have read Jesse Rocketka's posts in the Shudo translation thread, and they seem to understand the column pretty well. I don't think either of them instrumentally contributed to spreading this information. Some cunt on Twitter probably did. I also acknowledge that a media outlet lying about a breaking news item for clicks is much different in substance than fans getting a piece of esoteric trivia wrong. One of those is professional malfeasance, while the other is 
being wrong on the internet. And that's really not that big of a deal, right? Well, okay, but I like being right on the internet, but not to the hire a translator, edit a 30 minute video correcting the record level. I've been thinking a lot about why, of all the misconceptions in Pokemon, this is the one that bothered me the most. At first, I figured it was just how bizarre the claim was. It was so easily disproven, so why hadn't someone just pointed out the obvious already? How did the Kill Misty myth get so much cultural cash, and why were people so invested in the myth to begin with? When I finally came to understand what was at stake, shipping and fan bickering, I was pretty unimpressed. But as I did more research, I gained a new appreciation for dispelling the myth for a completely different reason. Here's what I came up with. So I wouldn't care if the myth was just some random factoid that people got wrong. But it's not. People don't just say the myth as an innocuous fun fact, they say it because it serves some kind of agenda to them. They use it to insult others, win internet slap fights, and overall be an asshole to people online. And if you're going to be an asshole, you should at least have the dignity to be an asshole because you're right, not as a cover for your own ignorance or the fact that you got your feelings hurt in the middle of a Twitter spat. Misty was never my favorite growing up. but. I can recognize that for a lot of Pokemon fans, she was very important to them. Misty was their favorite character, their role model, maybe even their childhood crush. And I can respect that passion up to a point. But Misty is also a cartoon character, and I don't really care about her. In fact, I realize that this video, for me, isn't about Misty at all. It's actually about Takeshi Shudo. In my opinion, Takeshi Shudo is the most misunderstood and most unfairly maligned figure in the Pokemon anime. The average fan may not know his name or what he did, but the ones who do generally don't speak about him from a place of kindness. Few of those fans know that he did anything except Pokemon, and even fewer, I think, have read any of his original words that haven't been filtered through some cunt on Twitter. The Kill Misty myth presents Shudo as a misogynist, an abusive drunkard, possibly a pedophile, and a hack writer who hated his own characters so much that he couldn't wait to throw them away for someone more attractive. Takeshi Shudo was none of those. His worst flaw was that he was genuinely passionate about his work, to the extent that he often made very bad decisions about his own health. But fans have continued to run with this piece of fiction because they are upset about changes he didn't make to the anime. But unlike Misty and the others, Takeshi Shudo was a human being. He was a very troubled and complicated human being, but he was a human being nonetheless. Outside of his role as the boogeyman for Pokemon, he was a dutiful husband and father. He was a writer who was admired and respected by his peers in the industry. And upon his death, he was someone who left so many good memories behind him for friends and fans alike that he was valorized for his contributions as an artist. The fact that Pokemon fans have reduced his legacy to either a punchline about T-Rex fossils, or as a woman hater who killed their childhood fave, is a travesty. Trying to move the needle ever so slightly on that misconception is really what this video is about. And there are so many myths about Shudo that Pokemon fans just believe at face value that dispelling one doesn't even put a dent into it. But then again, fandoms and critical thinking never go hand in hand. Maybe it's a lost cause to try. But if nothing else, at least I can say that I was right on the internet. Hey folks, while I was editing this video, I found out that the translator I hired, Wendy Gitlord, is seeking funds to buy copies of Takeshi Shudo's novelization of the early Pokemon anime in order to get high-resolution scans of the images in it. Obviously, given the subject of this video, I think that is a pretty good cause to highlight. I don't want any money, so if you want to contribute to the struggle, this is a good way to do it. Now I'll stop talking and let you enjoy the background for the 20 seconds or however long YouTube lets us put shit up on the screen for. Bye!